Just a reminder: I am going to be on the Get Vocal app every Thursday at 7 p.m. Central to talk all things true crime. It's a great way for you to interact with me and other listeners of the show. Head to Get Vocal. That's G E T V O K L dot com, or download the app on the App Store. And I'll see you there this Thursday. Explicit content is found in this episode, so listener discretion is advised. Welcome back to the True Crime Fan Club podcast. I'm your host, Lainey. The events of September 11th, 2001, left America reeling. Most of us felt bewildered, shocked, and saddened. We took those feelings and rallied together, doing whatever we could to help the victims of the worst terrorist attack to take place on American soil. But some of us couldn't shake the overwhelming feeling of rage towards the perpetrators of the attack. They looked at their neighbors, the ones who spoke with certain accents, talked in different languages, or wore certain types of clothing, and deemed them the enemy. Violence against the Muslim community, as well as those mistaken as Muslim, began in earnest as fear and anger began to take over a portion of the American population. One of those people was Mark Anthony Stroman, a man who saw himself as a patriot, who was exacting revenge against the victims of 9/11 as he went on a killing spree in Dallas, Texas. Okay, on to the show. On September fifteenth, two thousand one. Wakar Hassan was grilling hamburgers in his convenience store, Mom's Grocery, in the Pleasant Grove neighborhood of Dallas, Texas. Forty-six-year-old Wakar left his wife Duri and four daughters, Nita, Usuna, Anam, and Ikra, in Milltown, New Jersey, to find better economic opportunities for the family that had immigrated from Pakistan. Thirty-one-year-old Mark Stroman, an admitted white supremacist who was angry about the attacks on the World Trade Center. Was looking for revenge. He would later say, quote, "This was not a crime of hate, but an act of passion and patriotism, an act of country and commitment, an act of retribution and recompose. This was not done during peacetime, but at wartime." Mark walked into Mom's grocery and shot Wakar in the head, killing him where he stood. On September twenty-first, two thousand one. Twenty-seven-year-old Ray's Bouillon was working at Buckner Food Mart in Central Dallas. Ray spent his first two years in America living in New York, but moved to Dallas at the beginning of the summer on the advice of a friend. Once he realized he could afford to study, pay his rent, and work, the choice was easy to make. Back in his home in Bangladesh, Ray's was no slacker. He was an Air Force pilot and qualified as a Microsoft Certified Systems Engineer. He had a fiance, Abida, whom he was madly in love with, but his dream was to live in America. So, when he won the proverbial lottery, a diversity visa, he was willing to start all over to live in the country of his dreams. At Buckner Food Mart, Ray's was used to getting robbed, but the day Mark Stroman walked into his store would forever change his life. Ray's told his story to the New York Times. It was、uh, September twenty first, two thousand one, around twelve thirty p.m.、Uh, I was working in a friend's gas station in Dallas, Texas, and I just moved from New York City to Dallas for、uh, for a better future. And、um, it was pretty.、Uh, it was a different experience to work in a gas station, and I didn't mind doing that.、Uh, I came to U.S. for pursuing、uh, further higher education in、uh, in computer science and.、Uh, So I didn't mind to start from scratch. It was pretty interesting to work in a gas station, selling、uh, three tamales for one dollar, or maybe a candy for thirty-five cents. And as a pilot officer in the Air Force, you never get a chance to do something like that. So I was enjoying、uh, actually the work, and it gave me a chance to to connect with the American people.、Uh, I would say more friendly in a very、uh, Grassroots level and see, you know,、uh, all kinds of people coming to gas station. Pretty, you know,、uh, enjoying、uh, that work. But that particular day, ten days after 9/11,、uh, terrorist attack, business was pretty slow, and it was、uh, 
raining cats and dogs since morning and um, around 12.30 p.m. I saw through the, through the glass of the gas station, uh, through the window, a customer uh, was coming, but he had a, um, he was wearing a, a bandana, sunglasses. I was robbed before, and uh, so as soon as I saw that customer wearing bandana, sunglasses, and a baseball cap, and holding something black and shiny on his right waist, I realized it would be a robbery. So right there, I was ready uh, with the cash on the counter, stepped a few, uh, few steps uh, back from the uh, counter. He, as soon as he walked in, I said, sir, here is all the money. Take it, but please do not shoot me. But he was not looking at the money, though. He was looking at me. And I felt a cold air flow through my spine. Why he's not looking at the money? If he's here to rob me, he should be taking the money and live the stress as soon as possible. But then he mumbled a question. Where are you from? And before I could say more than excuse me, he pulled the trigger from four to five feet away. And I felt it first uh, like a million bees stinging my face. And then I heard the sound, the big explosion. He shot me in the right side of my face and head. And um, I looked down to the floor, and so blood was pouring like an open faucet from the right side of my head. And uh, frantically, I placed both hands on my head, thinking I had to keep my brain from spilling out. And I remember myself screaming, Mom, very loudly. And I was shaking so hard, I even could not dial 911. And I looked left, saw the gunman was still standing looking at me and I thought if I pretend that I'm dying he will not shoot me anymore so I jumped on the floor and after a few seconds he left the store well um, I grabbed the phone uh, but I was shaking so hard I couldn't dial 911 and I was so afraid that I would pass out any moment inside the gas station so I grabbed the phone ran out outside to the barber store next door and uh, three men inside looked at me in horror uh, they thought uh, the gunman was right behind me and they tried to escape uh, out by the emergency exit door and I grabbed one of them and he screamed please call 911 I am dying I don't want to die today and one of them called 911 and while he called I caught myself in the mirror and I couldn't believe that it was me the image reflecting back at me was gruesome. Um, a few minutes earlier, I had been a smiling, healthy young man, 27 years old. In the instant it takes to pull the trigger, I had become disfigured, fighting to stay awake, fighting to stay alive. No, uh, what happened as a result of the shooting, I, I received more than 35 pillars on my face, and at least two of them went through my right eye. And after several uh, surgeries, the eye specialist was able to save the vision, uh, save the eye, but the vision is gone. I had better than perfect 20 by 10 vision. So in my left eye, I have 20 by 10, but on the right eye, zero. Ray's was discharged the next day because he didn't have health insurance. For the next several months, he relied on the help of friends and slept on their couches. He also had to rely on doctor samples for medications, including eye drops and painkillers. Ray's had to have several operations on his right eye, which, to this day, limited vision is restored. On October 4th, Mark Stroman entered the gas station that was owned by 49-year-old Vasudev Patel. Vasudev and his family, Hindus from India, had owned the gas station in Mesquite, a Dallas suburb, for almost a decade. Surveillance video captured Mark storming in, waving a 44 pistol while demanding Vasudev open the register. As Vasudev reached under the counter for the gun he kept for protection, Mark shot him in the chest. Vasudev fell to the ground, mortally wounded. As he lay dying on the ground, Mark tried to open the cash register but was unsuccessful. He then leaned over the counter and shouted at Vasudev, Open the register or I will kill you. Mark then fled the scene without any money. Vasudev died from his wounds. 
That same day, Tom Boston, owner of a paint and body shop, was driving home to pick up a refrigerator to bring back to his store in North Dallas. As he passed the Shell station owned by Vasudev, a man Tom knew well as he frequented the gas station often, he noticed a flurry of police activity and camera crews. On his way back, Tom stopped as close as he could to the gas station and asked a Channel 23 reporter what all the fuss was about. That was when he learned that Vasudev had been shot to death earlier that morning. At first, Tom was shocked. He left, driving back to his auto body shop in a daze. After a few moments, a strange thought came into his head. He wondered if a man who once worked for him, a man who was prone to making threats about killing Arabs, could have been involved. He hadn't been in touch with Mark Stroman in a long time, but Tom had heard through the grapevine that Mark may have been involved with a string of robberies that targeted Arab-run businesses. Tom had thought that Mark was all talk, but maybe he wasn't. Just in case, he called a big-shot prosecutor friend with his concerns. He told the prosecutor that if there was surveillance and if that surveillance showed a man with two hog thighs for arms, covered in tattoos, to give Tom a call. It didn't take long for Mesquite police to get in touch with Tom. They dragged him into the station and had him write an initial statement before watching the surveillance tape. The tape showed Mark wearing a fake beard, screaming at Vasudev to open the register as a man was bleeding out on the floor. There was no doubt in Tom's mind that it was his former employee on the tape. Police had what they needed to make an arrest. On October 5th, Dallas police intercepted Mark as he pulled into his house. Mark tried to run from his Thunderbird into the back of his house, but was quickly apprehended. While he was running... Mark dropped a chrome Smith & Wesson out of his waistband. Later, police would remark that after he was read his Miranda rights and while he was being questioned, Mark was laughing and crying at the same time. Prosecutors were looking to put Mark away for the longest time possible and wanted to use their strongest case to do so. On November 15, 2001, Mark was indicted by a Dallas County grand jury for the capital murder of Vasudev Patel. Mark admitted to the murder, as well as the murder of Wakar and attempted murder of Rays. An inmate that Mark confessed to testified in Mark's trial that Mark had cased Vasudev's store and didn't see any cameras. Mark also told the inmate that had he not been caught, his next plan was to go to a shopping mall and start shooting everyone who looked Middle Eastern. On April 2, 2002, Mark Stroman was found guilty of capital murder. On April 4th, after a separate punishment hearing, Mark was sentenced to death. During the punishment hearing, the jury heard all about Mark's troubles with the law. Mark's run-ins with the law began as a juvenile when he was convicted of aggravated robbery, car theft, and burglary of a habitation at least twice. An interview with a psychologist as an adult revealed that beginning at the age of nine, Mark began stealing bicycles and cars, sold and used drugs, ran away from home, and was disruptive in school. The superintendent of the Collin County Juvenile Detention Center testified that Mark was not successful in juvenile probation and did not take advantage of any of the programs offered to help treat his drug addiction. He further described Mark as troubled and in need of guidance and counseling. It's no surprise that Mark continued with his criminal behavior into adulthood, A Dallas police sergeant testified that he arrested Mark for possession of an illegal switchblade on September 20, 1985. Mark was arrested again on November 15, 1989, when he was found with brass knuckles, an illegal weapon under Texas law at the time. Mark was also convicted of burglary and sentenced to two years in prison after ransacking a man's home and stealing jewelry, clothes, checks, and rifles. Mark emptied the man's bank account by writing hot checks, and the man never got his property back. On November 6, 1990, Mark stole a woman's purse and used her credit cards. He was convicted of robbery and sentenced to eight years in prison, as well as an additional two years for credit card abuse. On July 14, 2001, Mark was arrested for bringing an illegal firearm into an establishment that sold alcohol. He was indicted for unlawful possession of a firearm by a felon, but was released on bond on July 16, 2001. 
Mark was on bond when he committed the murders of Wakar and Vasudev and the attempted murder of Reyes. With all of this information in mind, it was no wonder that the jury would consider Mark too dangerous to ever be let back into society, let alone continue to live in it. During the punishment phase, Mark did have people testify in his defense. Tina Stroman, Mark's maternal aunt, told the jury about Mark's difficult upbringing. Born October 13, 1969, Mark lived his life as Mark Baker for many years until he learned the truth, that his father was not Wallace Baker, but an old boyfriend of Mark's mother, who you would never come to know. According to Tina, Mark's mother Sandra and stepfather were not interested in being parents. Sandra's other sister, Sue Carlson, also testified about Mark's childhood. She said that not long after Mark was born, Sandra ran off, leaving Mark and his two sisters with her mother. A few months later, the family got a call from a hospital in Shreveport, Louisiana. Sandra had been found lying in the gutter. She was also pregnant. Sue testified that Sandra gave birth to twins, gave them up for adoption, then came back home to her children. Sue also testified about Sandra being a compulsive neat freak who would never allow her children to sit on the furniture. Wallace often verbally and physically abused Mark. To add to an already stressful environment, Sandra and Wallace were heavy drinkers whose drinking often led to screaming and fighting. While they were drinking, the children had to be in their bedrooms because Wallace would want to eat his dinner and drink in peace without the children around. Sue testified to a Christmas that she remembered where the children ate in their bedroom so Wallace could drink at dinner. But the witness who would testify the most ardently in Mark's defense was his ex-wife, Tina. Tina gave birth to their daughter, Amber, on September 9, 1985. They got married in January 1986 when Mark was 16 years old and Tina was 15. The small family lived down the street from Tina's family, and though the couple loved each other, they fought constantly. Despite having a family to take care of, or maybe because of it, Mark was arrested for burglarizing a building on Christmas Day in 1986. His lawyer at the time argued that crime was just for stealing food. Nevertheless, it put Mark back on law enforcement's radar. Three weeks after his arrest, Tina gave birth to their second child, a boy named Robert. In October 1987, Mark was arrested again for a string of burglaries he committed with a friend. It was at this point things were also starting to go downhill with Tina. There was an incident where Tina got a gash on her neck that she swears she did not get from Mark. Instead, she claims that she cut her wrist in an attempt to gain Mark's attention because she felt like she lost his love. After a struggle with the knife, Tina received a stab wound to the neck. It wasn't long after this incident, when on September 8, 1988, that Tina gave birth to their third child, Erica. Mark and Tina's relationship was more off than on at that point, and it was well known that Erica was not his child, but to Mark's credit, he always treated her as if she were his own. The jury also heard from Tina about Mark's grandfather coming to visit him during one of his stints in jail. His grandfather said that he would probably die while Mark was serving his sentence. He also said that Mark would probably lose his wife. Both statements proved to be prophetic. Despite the testimony about Mark's difficult upbringing, the jury did not take any pity on him. Mark Stroman filed multiple appeals against his sentence, with a few of them going all the way to the United States Supreme Court. This all culminated with Mark filing for clemency with the Texas Board of Pardons and Parole in June 2011, which was ultimately denied. Mark was now out of options and was sentenced to die by lethal injection. But as much as this is a story of one man's hate, it is also a story of one man's forgiveness. After his injury, Ray's faced a long road to recovery. He didn't just have physical injuries to recover from, but emotional ones as well. As his medical debt piled up, Ray struggled to reintegrate himself back into the real world. Would someone else like Mark find him and finish the job? Thoughts like these plagued Ray's as he saw his American dream slowly slip away. 
I'm going to pause the case right here so you can hear a word from our sponsors. Globe Inn is a monthly subscription of fair trade goods from all around the world. Each artisan box is a curated themed collection of handmade items for the home. These can include everything from Moroccan ceramics to handwoven Mexican baskets to tea, coffee, and food items. In my cozy box, I got a handwoven basket from Mexico, a beautiful hand painted ceramic mug from Tunisia, and some hot cocoa from Ghana. Globin is a verified member of the Fair Trade Federation, which means they pay artisans a reliable wage which covers all of their basic needs. Every month, Globin has four to five brand new box themes, and you can choose one of these as your monthly selection. Or if you like to be surprised like I do, then they can choose for you. To get $20 off your first box on any three plus month subscription, head to globin.com and enter the code TCFC at checkout. Once again, to get $20 off your first box on any three plus month subscription, head to globin.com and enter code TCFC at checkout. If you are practicing social distancing like I am, which means reducing unnecessary trips out and trying to avoid sold out grocery stores, then check out Sunbasket. It's a perfect and delicious solution for the times we're living in. With that in mind, I picked out some fun meals and snacks for me and my family to munch on. I am so excited to get my basket and will follow up in the next episode with what I got. They make it easy and convenient with everything pre-portioned and ready to prep and cook. You can enjoy a dinner full of organic produce and clean ingredients in as little as 15 minutes, which, yes, I am totally here for. No matter how much experience you have in the kitchen, which for me is a lot, but my husband, not so much. And the best part is Sun Basket facilities have the highest levels of food and employee safety. They are reinforcing strict adherence to their existing standard operating procedures and increasing sanitation frequency in their distribution centers in order to protect you and your family. Right now, Sunbasket is offering $35 off your order when you go right now to sunbasket.com slash TCFCP and enter promo code TCFCP at checkout. That's sunbasket.com slash TCFCP and enter promo code TCFCP at checkout for $35 off your order. Raze's family begged him to come home, but the soldier in him wouldn't quit. He was still committed to creating a life in America for himself and his fiance. A few months after the shooting, he took a job in telemarketing. It was a job that wouldn't tax his health, but it also wouldn't force him into the world that was still a little frightening to him. By this time, Mark had already been arrested and his trial was looming. Raze was terrified. Although Mark wasn't going to be tried for what he did to Ray's, Ray's was still subpoenaed to testify against Mark. Ray's wanted to do his civic duty, but he was still scared that someone would try to finish what Mark started. Court officers knew that Ray's was scared, so every morning of the trial, they would escort him to the Frank Crowley Courts building and hold him in a small office near the 292nd District Courtroom, where the trial was being held. At the end of each day, those same officers would escort him home. During that time, Ray's fear was so great that he would refuse to even go to the bathroom. As it turned out, Ray's worried for nothing. His testimony was bare bones. The prosecutor just wanted to establish Mark's crime spree and did not go into great detail about the crimes committed against Ray's and McCarr. With the trial behind him, Ray's could continue with trying to achieve his American dream. After the trial, Ray's went back to Bangladesh to finally bring Abida, the woman he loved, back with him to the States. But when he saw her, it was clear that things had changed. She commented on the fact that she was surprised there were no scars on his face. Her demeanor, once warm and full of love, was now cold and distant. Soon, it became clear to Ray's why she changed. Abita's family, tired of waiting on Ray's, had pressured Abita to accept a marriage proposal from another man. Ray's was crushed, but he understood. He went back to Dallas without Abita, 
but not without his resolve to make his dreams come true. When he returned from Bangladesh, Reyes took a job at an olive garden in Mesquite, a suburb of Dallas. Though he had no serving experience, he tackled the challenge like he did every other in his life, with everything he had. He watched other servers carefully until he could master the art of small talk. The faithful Muslim man who never had a drop of alcohol in his life eventually became one of the top alcohol sellers of the restaurant. Despite the money that he was bringing in, this was not the life Reyes had dreamed for himself. He wanted to be in the IT or information technology field. He found affordable classes through contacts in the Muslim community, where he studied Microsoft SQL platform. Microsoft SQL is a software system that companies use in order to store and retrieve large quantities of data. The job position would ultimately be the one keeping the system running smoothly for the company, clearing it of bugs and blockages. Reyes went to school during the weekdays and on the weekends he worked at Olive Garden. When he finished school, he found a job using his new SQL skills and left Olive Garden altogether. Reyes finally had his American dream, and he was living it, when his life crashed into Mark Stroman's once again. Life on death row is an exercise in tedium. Every day was the same. Same routine, same food, same cell. Mark would try to break up the time by working out or staring out the window for long stretches of time. But mostly, he spent time thinking. At first, he was still filled with hatred. He hated the men who were responsible for putting him there. He hated the fat guards who were clearly eating better than him. Most of all, he was hating himself. Death Row gave Mark a lot of time to think about what he had done and why he had done it. This change was documented by Israeli filmmaker Elon Ziv. Elon was looking for a subject for his next documentary film when he came across Mark's story. He was immediately intrigued and asked for an interview. Mark accepted, and Elon was completely unprepared for what Mark would say during that first interview. Quote, He was such an emotional mess, crying and tearing up all the time. He was so vulnerable, and I wasn't expecting that. I was expecting a pathological serial killer. He went on to describe how Mark's transformation happened in stages. Quote, in 2004, he already knew he'd done something wrong, but at that time, he didn't make any connection with the views he held and their impact on his behavior. He was still saying he was an American patriot, that he did what Americans wanted to do, but that only he was crazy enough to do it. What really convinced Elon of Mark's transformation was what he said after the Fort Hood massacre in 2009. Mark told him he was very angry at this crazy Muslim who had shot everyone. But Elon told him he saw the perpetrator as just a crazy, screwed-up individual who just as much represented Muslims as Mark represented white Christians. That seemed to hit home for Mark and signaled a major turn in his attitude. The time in prison combined with his growing friendship with Elon began to change Mark. He started out feeling no remorse for what he'd done, but that slowly changed over time, and his last years in prison were spent avoiding trouble. Mark even began to deny his white supremacist beliefs. When he was ultimately executed, he finally apologized and took accountability for the lives he so carelessly stole. Some of his final words were quoted in a CNN article called Texas Inmates Set to Die for Hate Crimes in 9-11 Wake. Quote, I am a human being and made a terrible mistake out of love, grief, and anger. And let's just say I could not think clearly anymore, and I'm sorry to say I made innocent people pay for my rage, anger, grief, and loss. As a deadly cocktail of drugs hit his bloodstream, he looked out through the window, saying I love you to the five friends who were there, watching. He counted down as the drugs took effect, and about 11 minutes later, at 8.53 p.m., he was pronounced dead. Vasudev Patel's relatives did not attend the execution, but they did have a police representative in their place. Because his second victim, Reyes, filed a lawsuit to reverse Mark's execution, it was delayed for around three hours. But the United States Supreme Court denied Reyes' request, and therefore, the execution proceeded. 
Ray's Bouillon coped with his injuries and loss in a very different manner than most. He forgave. Ray's desperately tried not to only stay Mark's execution, but to halt it altogether. His beliefs as a religious Muslim meant that he felt compelled to forgive Mark. In the same New York Times article I previously mentioned, Ray's was quoted as saying, I was raised very well by my parents and teachers. Even if they hurt you, don't take revenge. Forgive them. I decided that forgiveness was not enough, that what he did was out of ignorance. I decided I had to do something to save this person's life, that killing someone in Dallas is not an answer for what happened on September 11th. He's another human being like me. Ray started a petition to reverse Mark's life sentence, even developing a website and setting up a meeting with state officials to spare the life of the man that tried to kill him. Knowing how the crime happened and the subsequent injuries that affected Ray's, it is truly incredible that he can show so much forgiveness towards Mark. While Ray's wasn't successful in preventing Mark's execution, he did continue to advocate as a human rights activist by founding the nonprofit organization called World Without Hate. He fought for the life of his murderer and preached for tolerance for minorities and refugees. Wakar Hassan was only 46 years old when he was murdered. He moved to Pleasant Grove from New Jersey around a year prior. He planned to bring his family with him once he was able to establish himself with a home and employment. They wanted to start a new life, but sadly, within a year, Wakar was dead and unable to pursue the dream with his family any further. What is even more tragic is that when he was killed, Wakar applied for a green card, but his application became null and void upon his death. The news meant his family was under the threat of deportation on top of having to mourn the husband and father they adored. While no one could blame them for not wanting to stay in the country that cost them so much, Wakar's family did want to stay in the community that they felt was home. The Hassan's community loved them back and considered them victims of 9-11. In 2004, with the help of United States Representative Rush Holt, they were granted legal residency permanently. Mark's last meal was a ham and cheese omelet with onions, tomatoes, bacon, potatoes, chicken fried steak, pork chops with sunny side up eggs, fried squash and okra, Dr. Pepper, and for dessert, bluebell vanilla ice cream. And a few lines taken directly from Mark's blog, he is quoted, Greetings and respect. My name is Mark Stroman and I am currently awaiting execution in this modernized dungeon of death that most call Texas Death Row. It's a nightmare to come to life. I cannot tell you that I am an innocent man. I am not asking you to feel sorry for me, and I won't hide the truth. I am sorry to say I made innocent people pay for my rage, anger, grief, and loss. I have destroyed my victims' families as well as my own. I see things so much clearer now. Life is precious and full of surprises. With respect, I remain in the struggle. Mark Stroman Okay, fan club members, as I conclude this episode, my one question to you is, how will you sleep tonight? Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, please be sure to rate, subscribe, and positively review the show on Apple Podcasts or your podcast player of choice. It really does help us out. You can find us on most social media platforms, Twitter at TCFCPod, Facebook.com slash TCFC Podcast. You can also find us on Instagram at True Crime Fan Club Pod. And of course, our website is TrueCrimeFanClub.com. If you have an episode request, send us an email at TCFCPod at gmail.com. This episode was written by Mary Cole and Brittany Martinez, researched and edited by Brittany Martinez, produced by the best in the business, Nico at We Talk of Dreams. Check him out on Twitter at We Talk of Dreams or WeTalkOfDreams.com. I'm your host, Lainey. <laughs>